This is a video for our Accounting 341 group assignment. We are looking at the New Zealand Blood Service. Our group members are... Hayden Newman. It's Xu Ya Ying. It's Jasmine. And Logan Eisen. The New Zealand Blood Service was established in 1998 to ensure the safe supply of blood and blood products to the New Zealand health sector. They have the responsibility for all aspects of the transfusion process, from the collection of the blood from the donor, to the transfusion of blood and the blood products to the recipients. They operate a vein-to-vein -vein transfusion service. The New Zealand Blood Service has donor centres in the major towns throughout New Zealand. In addition to this, they have mobile collection units that travel around the country and take collections from workplaces, high schools and universities. I would like to introduce the process of New Zealand Blood Service operation. Generally, they collect, produce and store blood products first. They collect fresh products such as red blood cycles and uh, platelets and the plasma. Then they turn these products into uh, what? <laughs> blood bags <laughs> and frozen plasma and cryo participate. The New Zealand Blood Service also sends some produ production to Australia for special treatment and converted to over 20 different countries. Funding structure. Funding is important for every organization and basically the funding is about the money, right? Where is the money comes from, the money inflow? Uh, one unique feature for the New Zealand Black Service is there is no direct funding from government. Most fees from serving, ser from serving the district health boards. And uh, okay, let's look through how their financial performance based on the auditing report 2012. And they have. They have 102.3 million income in 2011, and the expense is 93 million. Therefore, they have 9.3 million surplus, which is quite good financial performance. And the New Zealand Blood Service is quite accountable because they rebate the surplus to the district health boards. As I mentioned in last section about the the process of how the New Zealand Blood Service operate, um, the most expense are production cost, like they collect, uh, produce and store 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 blood products, and some labor fees, some other depression cost. The expense cumulated increase of 9.6% and there is only slightly increase, right? And the, the increase of the cost are most used in improving safety and new technology. The New Zealand Blood Service is not just focusing on what they achieved, they also look forward. Okay, let's say what the intention. Based on the auditing report 2012, they have the statement of intention for the next few years. They want to renew their capital assets and fa facilities, um, upgrade technology, for example, and they want to provide substantially service. Uh, most is about accommodation issues, and therefore to cover this additional costs that may increase the price about of the blood products. An aspect that I found the most interesting about the New Zealand Blood Service is the efficiency of operations. So, the New Zealand Blood Service is extremely efficient in the way that it conducts operations to the point where during the last audit, the team can make no suggestions for improvement. This is an impressive result as the Blood Service is the only organisation that is responsible for the transporting blood products in New Zealand, with approximately 40,000 people being treated each year. They are able to maximise efficiency by focusing on two important factors. The first, using accurate and relevant information for decision making. And the second, effectively managing the supply chain. So the first point, using accurate and relevant information for decision making. 
One of the most important tasks that Bud's service undertakes is collecting and managing and, and collecting and using accurate information for the use of improving its functions and operations. Because of this, it is able to manage and minimize potential risks that could have detrimental effects in the way that it operates and distributes Bud products to the public. The information source for such areas as DHBs from around the country to compare forecasts with demand, identifying trends in the demand of Bud products both nationally and internationally, and also considering events that will substantially change the demand in these products. As a result of this forecast, the Bud service is able to minimise the total amount of Bud products that are wasted each year. As it stands now, only 10% of the Bud products are ever wasted, with aims to make this percentage decrease in the near future. This is a difficult number to maintain, as the life of Bud products differ depending on the type. For example, plasma, if frozen, can have a life of around 2 years, while platelets have a maximum life of only 5 days. The Bud service manages to maintain this low discard percentage through a collection of processes. For example, it implements a return scheme where blood products that are close to expiring can be sent back to the blood service and redistributed to larger hospitals. The blood product will more likely be used at this larger hospital and the business that sent it in will get a replacement. Also to note is that the blood service will distribute the expired blood to other institutions for the purpose of education or medical research. So as to additionally minimise the total waste of these blood products. Another important aspect of producing reliable forecasts is to match the estimated demand of blood products with its actual demand each year. If the blood service would experience a shortage of blood products, then the health and safety of the public that relies on these products will be compromised. In addition, a surplus of blood products creates unnecessary wastage, which goes against the blood service's values that the, donation, that the donation of blood is a gift, not a right. The blood service has been very effective in estimating appropriate demand for blood products over the years, with no shortages and only minor surpluses have been recorded. So the second point is effectively managing the supply chain. Cool. So the other fundamental factor in maximising efficiency of its operations is controlling its supply chain in a manner which minimises its costs without compromising its safety and supply. As the blood service is a not-for-profit government agency, focus on revenues would be a waste of the organisation's resources, and so the focus has been solely on minimising costs and passing on the savings to the public. The blood service is responsible for each step of the blood transfusion process, from collection of blood to its distribution. This gives the organisation freedom to effectively manage and tweak certain processes to find the structure of best fit. The processes are as follows. First, the blood service collects the blood from willing donors. The donors are tested beforehand through a series of questions relating to their health and to ensure their eligibility. Second, the blood service is then sent away to one of the facilities where it is tested for diseases and infections such as AIDS or HIV. The blood service then processes all donations, it filters the blood, a process called lacer depletion, to reduce the risk of adverse transfusion, re transfusion reactions and diseases. Once completed, the blood will be separated into red blood cells and plasma. Lastly, the blood is then stored in special facilities and distributed to hospitals all over the country. So, the blood service managed to keep its cost increases in the recent years below those of the wider health sector. This is mainly achieved through efficient negotiation methods with a single lead, D lead DHB chief executive rather than negotiating with several groups. This occurs each year, where the blood service negotiates and agrees upon any cost increase in respect of its product with a single contact, and ensures national consistency. Over the past five financial years, to the 2011-2012 year, the overall, incre overall increase in compound price has been approximately 13.61% in the New Zealand health sector. In comparison, the blood service has recorded an increase of just 7.61% over the same period, which is a substantial feat. Donors and the treatment of them are crucial to the New Zealand Blood Service. They take donor safety very seriously and have many measures in place to ensure the safety and well-being of their donors. Firstly, donors must meet health and age criteria and before they donate they must have a health assessment with a registered nurse. The Blood Service also monitors their patients after they have donated and have services such as helplines operated by nurses to assist donors. These methods have the added benefit of making the actual blood they donate safer by screening out potentially ineligible donors. Donor Enrolment and Retention The New Zealand Blood Service is always looking for new donors to up their current stock levels and to gain some new regular donors to help meet future requirements. They run targeted campaigns at young adults as well as Māori and Pacifica with the intention of raising the participation rates amongst these demographics. Retaining donors is crucial to the blood service for their ongoing requirements. By having scheduled appointments, the service can know what type of products are coming in 
and when they are coming in. This means they can adjust accordingly depending on the expected demand. This helps enormously with their efficiency as they have partial control over their future supply and they can manage this to best effect. The New Zealand Blood Service actively tracks and monitors their effectiveness through donor questionnaires, active donors and the frequency or average time between donations. They do this so they can gauge the satisfaction of donors and the quality of service they are providing to them. The last section is going to talk about the international practice of NZ Blood Service, which will focus on two parts. The first part is international networking and monitoring. NZ Blood Service is involved in working with different international organizations, and the main function or the main involvement of this organization are blood transfusion service or compare within the members. For example, NZ Blood Service is a member of ASA Pacific Blood blood network, which promotes blood safety and uh, efficient blood service operations. Every year, the organization also compares its member, so it's uh, building networking with other international organizations aims to promote the blood safety and efficient blood service operations. In addition, NZ Blood Service is also involved in international monitoring paths. For example, uh -huh. NZ Blood is a member of a guys drafting group, which called European Directorate for the Quality of Medicine and Healthcare Guide. This guide set up and updates international best practice in blood transfusion medicine and the safety and quality of blood com components. The second part is about the benchmarking internationally. NZ Blood work with other providers to create international performance benchmarks. Uh, to keep and improve the standard of blood service or the blood products, but it's difficult to achieve it because there are a number of providers involved in this practice and they operate under different policy, medical or regulatory framework and also produce the different products. So it's hard to make one standard for every providers. However, the benchmarking internationally is important for blood service or the blood or the product producing process. So it's necessary to understand the reason for the difference. I think one of the most important things for NZ blood is to uh, compare with others to improve itself and also to take a more responsibility to the people, to the society and to the country. So to conclude is the New Zealand Blood Service successful in the way that it operates in terms of its service provided and accountability? The New Zealand Blood Service is able to effectively meet the estimated demand each year with its actual demand through the use of its reliable and accurate information. As such, there has been no shortage of blood products in New Zealand and the health and safety of the public has not been suffered. Also, the New Zealand Blood Service operates extremely efficiently, with the audit team suggesting that other businesses take note of the way the Blood Service conducts operations. High customer care, efficient cost schemes, and highly trained staff are a key factor in its success. One of the best features of the Bud Service is to effectively take on board criticism and to improve its performance based on the feedback of customers. As such, they have a strong planning process for continuous improvements to be made, with plans of the future to further meet its demand more effectively, and to also focus more on its collaboration with other institutions. This will further increase its efficiency in the future making the Bud Service an extremely successful business in terms of its operations in New Zealand. Thanks. This a question from Drinking Water Group is about will New Zealand Blood Service import blood if there is a shortage? The answer is they may import blood as they converted blood products to overseas for special treatment. Um, firstly, they do have clear plan to meet changing patterns in demand. For example, they use statistical data to analyze the trend of the demand of plasma. They also stock more blood products and try to maximum the shelf life and minimum, minimum the waste. For the record, the Ministry of Health Department has received no report of New Zealand Blood Service uh, able to supply its main products. For emergency situation, they prefer to call some registered donor to collect blood. The question I received was from Home Based Services. 
and it is what's the cost of blood in shambles wastage? Okay, so as the blood products are given both freely and willingly by the public to the New Zealand Blood Service, there is no actual cost in monetary returns given up upon wastage. All will be lost in set is the trusted confidence of the public, which, in terms of its operations and functions, is a much more important determinant of the New Zealand Blood Service. This is because if the public feels that the New Zealand Blood Service is not acting responsibly or in the best interest of them, then they might choose not to go through with their donations. This will create a shortage in supply of blood products in the New Zealand health sector, having detrimental effects on those who rely on these products. Meeting the actual demand of blood with its forecast demand is fundamental for the blood service to achieve, is that they are the only organisation in New Zealand tasked with the responsibility of transporting blood products, and so the public will have no other alternatives to take into consideration if there aren't enough to meet their demand. As I stated earlier, roughly 10% of blood products are wasted each year, which could suggest that improvements to its current forecasting and planning regime could be made. The Customs Service Group asked, What measures does the New Zealand Blood Service have in place to minimise risk, and who are they responsible to if these controls fail? The New Zealand Blood Service has numerous controls and procedures in place to minimise the risk to donors, recipients and staff. There is 28 separate publicly available documents detailing their policies and their methods, with the most crucial area being around the treatment of blood products and ensuring that the patient receives safe blood products that their bodies won't reject. One of the ways New Zealand Blood Service actively mitigates their risk is through the gathering and analysis of data to accurately forecast demand and prepare for external events such as the Christchurch earthquakes. By anticipating regular demand and the demand in extraordinary circumstances, the New Zealand Blood Service is able to prepare and ensure that they fulfil their role should a situation arise. The New Zealand Blood Service is also constantly adding to, updating and altering their own procedures. This happened as a result of new scientific findings and each change is subject to various approvals and discussions before it is implemented. These discussions and approvals include New Zealand Blood Service advisors, MedSafe representatives, medical directors from the various district health boards, and members from some of the international organisations that the New Zealand Blood Service is involved with. In terms of regulation and responsibility, the New Zealand Blood Service is directly regulated by MedSafe, which is a division of the Ministry of Health and is responsible for the regulation of medicines and medical devices within New Zealand. The New Zealand Blood Service is directly responsible to them and the Ministry of Health should they fail in delivering a safe supply of blood products to New Zealanders. The New Zealand Blood Service is also indirectly responsible to the people of New Zealand as they are funded by the government, albeit indirectly. How and the blood service compare with other overseas providers? I will use Australia as an example to compare with it because Australia pro uh, shares similar policy rules and also the local situation with New Zealand, while the difference also exists. Both NZ Blood Service and Australian Red Cross Blood Service are responsible for blood donation and relative service. They are both done very well in protecting blood recipients against infection and helping donors to maintain an adequate supply of blood and they are all involved in working with same international blood service organization to meet worldwide benchmarking. I think the uh, NZ Blood Service perform effective enough because unlike to ARCBS, NZ Blood Service is operated by NZ Government, not the New Zealand Red Cross, and NZ Blood Service is one of a few organizations uh, that provide a full Vent to vent nationally uh, integrated blood service, which means the NZ blood service involved in all stage and take all responsibility in blood in blood transfusion from donors to recipients. It it include uh, collecting blood from voluntary donors, testing donated blood, and uh, processing it into blood products and also managing the storage of, of blood in blood bank, provide advice to uh, hospitals about storing blood products, selling and uh, distribution blood 
products to hospital and giving specialist advice about the blood transfusion. While most countries, uh, most countries' blood service only take charge the blood collecting and testing part, but does not uh, provide advice to local hospital, uh, like Chinese uh, blood donating. So all of this performance make NZ blood service different from other providers, which make it in a high standard and perform more safety and efficient around the world. That's all, thank you. If you've got any questions, feel free to email any one of us in the group. Thanks.